So happy to be here. Can you hear me? Not yet. Oh, here it is. So happy and very excited to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me and for the incredible hospitality that both myself and my family uh, enjoying here. And I want to tell you, uh, God bless America. Yeah. And Israel. And I want to tell you that I'm very excited. I never spoke like this in a church. Actually, I thought it's going to be a small town <laughs> church. So I can embarrass my spirit, myself for the first time among friends. Yes. So thank you, friend. <laughs> you forgot to mention that this is the largest church in the area, and everything is going to be broadcast on TV. So I guess I'm going to embarrass myself now nationally. <laughs> But I, I will do my best. Um, one thing I didn't plan to say, but I feel almost much obliged to say it now. Um, you know, it's not just, how are you doing? I see some familiar faces in the crowd. Um, it's not just uh, the place, but it's also the time. And today is a very special day. Today is the 9th of Av, which is the uh, fasting most important day in the Jewish calendar, in the Hebrew calendar. And today all the Jews or the Hebrews around the world are actually sitting, not like you sitting, they sit on the floor and uh, they are mourning. It's the most important morning day in a year and they read uh, the scroll of lamentation. Most of the disasters that happened to my people happened on that day, on the 9th of Av. The Jewish tradition tells us that on that day the spies had sinned. And we've been condemned to wander for 40 years and not to go into the promised land. On that day, both the first temple and the second temple was destroyed and burned to the ground. On that day, many disasters happened to my people. There is a long list. The deportation from England, the deportation from France. And in the modern time, uh, the final solution, the Van Zee Committee. The Germans decided to annihilate all the Jews all over the world on that day. That's right. On that day starts the deportation of the largest ghetto in Europe, the Warsaw Ghetto, into Treblinka. Okay, I see there's uh, kids among us, so you know what Treblinka, the first gas chambers. The Nazis knew the Hebrew calendar, and they chose this day. So here I am, standing over here. Uh, is that a coincidence? No. I'm, sure, I'm sure my friend will have something to teach me about this. <laughs> and I'm a grandson of three Holocaust survivors. And I believe that I'm standing here uh, not just for myself, but also from the generations before me. And I will connect it to the visit in Israel. Because when you come to Israel, you just come yourself. You're actually fulfilling the dream of your ancestors. And for us to live in Israel, it's like living in a dream. Or I should say a prophecy. Yeah. Amen. A prophecy that came true. Yeah. Amen. And like the Pastor William said, you can watch it on TV, and you can come and experience it yourself. And I want to tell you that you are invited to come, and for the first time in the history, you can actually come. Don't take it for granted. Today you have the planes. Okay, it's a long flight. Yeah. <laughs> Try to do it with four young kids. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Took me about a week to recover. How are you doing? But today, for the first time in the history, you can come to the Bible land. And we are welcoming everybody. You can come as a community. And I think it's for the first time that I really want you to share this. The Israeli government or the National Parks authorities in Israel made most of the national parks in Israel accessible for people with wheelchairs. So you can tell your, tell your relatives there are no excuses. Yes. They can load their mobility scooter, yes, 
and take it all the way to the Bible land. And they can beat the whole group. <laughs> Leave you in the dust. So you might won't be able to do 100%, but you can do a good 80% of the tour. So for the first time in the history, everybody, everybody can come to the Bible land. So what I hear is to give you a little taste of what we are talking about um, on the tour. And I think that today, uh, you know, we have archaeology and we have new understanding today, so we can actually share uh, new uh, insights uh, and new learning. So I will try to share a little bit uh, from the tour over here with you. Another thing that we want to do before I forget, uh, with God's help, I hope that uh, my project for this year is to video as much as we can from the tour because we can't have everybody. Uh, we have about, I don't know, 15, 20 groups. Uh, um, I need to be at home. We are homeschooling our kids. Uh, I wish we had a school like this over here, uh, but we are homeschooling our kids at home, so I need to be at home. But we want to share as much as we can with as many people as we can. Uh, there is people in China. Uh, there are friends all over the world that we want them to see it. So our project is to put everything on video. So hopefully you will have it as a learning tool uh, yes. that you can use in the future yeah. with God's help. Um, where's my water bottle? Excuse me. Maybe we can start over there. By the way, I feel like home. I got the Jordan River just behind me. <laughs> and the Star of David just above me. Where can I put this? <laughs> On this? All right. Wow. And I'm drinking from the altar. Yeah. <laughs> um, we want to load the first one. I can speak about this, but it's only my logo. <laughs> We would like to have the next picture. Where is uh, Brother James that, that helped me so much? By the way, okay, let's speak about this logo. That represents the menorah. It was the, uh, okay, now you have to take it back for a moment. I just chose this as a logo. That was actually the symbol of the kingdom of Judea at Jesus' time. It represents the menorah with the seven branches. It was put on coins. That's why they didn't put the menorah. They put the tree, the day tree instead. Let's go forward. When you come, you will come to the Sea of Galilee, and that's the next picture. And the Sea of Galilee, or the landscape, is probably the most famous landscape all over the world. Definitely the most painted one in the history of art. And the reason for that is Yeshua. Jesus. Yes. yes, by the way, his name, Yeshua, means salvation. Yeshua, Jesus, came here when he was 30 years old. In that age, a priest will start serving God in the temple. And he was active in this area for two and a half years in his life between two major events, being baptized or immersed at the Jordan River by Yohanan, the preacher, yes. or John the Baptist, or in the Baptist Church, John the Baptist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the crucifixion in Jerusalem. For two and a half years, he was active over here, and almost everything you read in the New Testament happened right here at the Sea of Galilee. So when you come, you're going to be right there on this boat. I want to say a few words about the area of the Sea of Galilee because that's actually helped us to get more insights about the gospel. Okay, many people when they come today to the Sea of Galilee, they look very pastoralic and very quiet area. And like you say in America, I want you all to forget about it. It was one of the busiest places on earth. And if you want to remember the story of Israel, location, location, location. Israel is located between three different continents. Do I have the laser pointer somewhere over here? There was the control. Thank you. Oh, here you are. The story of Israel, location, location, location. It's located between three different continents, 
Europe up there, Asia, and Africa. And in the ancient times, everybody who wants to cross from Europe or from Asia down to Africa, they had to go through Israel. No airplanes, no big boats. Everything goes on land. Location, location, location. It's a narrow strip between the Mediterranean Sea on one side and the Arabian Desert. Arabian Desert, if we had a larger uh, screen or a larger map, all the way till the Jordan River. Okay, all the way till this, this wall on the other side. So it's a huge desert that nobody can cross, and everybody have to cross through Israel. And the most important highway was known as the Via Maris. I tried to do it over here, coming from Egypt and going all the way to Babylonia, through Nazareth, through Magdala, through Capernaum, and all the way north, Caesarea Philippi, Damascus, and eventually Babylonia number one highway of the ancient world. So what I want you to remember, that Jesus came by the way of the sea. He didn't come to find some peaceful time and to be still and quiet and meditate. He came to the busiest place on earth. Yeah. And those merchants that move from one road station to the next one, they can carry the news, the good news. The routes were first built for the armies, but they were used to spread the gospel all over. And the Sea of Galilee, this area, is actually a transit zone area. There are routes that go in all directions, and the gospel can spread to the Galilee, to the Jews, to the Decapolis area, to the non-Jews, to the north, and all over. The lake itself is a part of the junction. The best way to get from one side to the other was to take the boat. Remember he called the disciples, come with me and I'll make you fishermen of men, fishers of men. So those disciples will be the perfect messengers. They can cross from one side of the lake to the other side. And they carry people with them. Yes, you can think about them like bus drivers. Taking people from one side of the lake to the other. And on the way they can speak to you. And they can tell you about the greeds that Jesus do. The perfect messengers. Transit zone area. When you'll be there, you will see that one side was the Jewish side. That's the Galilee. The other side was the non-Jewish side. You see this? It's one of the Decapolis. And many times when you read the gospel, you read about, let us go to the other side. Remember that? Yes. Let us go to the other side. Let us go to the other side. It's a geographical movement from one side of the lake to the other. But remember, it was also a spiritual one. He came first for the lost sheep of Judah. And every time he went to the other side, it's crossing from the Jews to the non-Jews as well. Some miracles were done on that side, and some miracles were done on the other side. Okay? And we will talk more about it when you will come. Another thing, it was no hiding from anybody. Right here, Tiberius, that was the capital of the son of Herod the Great. His name was Herod as well. He took his father's title. That's the same guy, Antipas, the guy that beheaded John. He was looking to kill Jesus. And that was his capital city. On the other hand, that was Bethsaida. Bethsaida. It became a Roman polis at Yeshua days called Julius, and that was the winter capital of the other son of Herod's, Philippos. So what I want you to remember, that Jesus was no hiding from anyone. He did all that under the nose of the two sons of Herod the Great. They heard and knew everything that he did. So transit zone area, one side Jews, one side non-Jews, yes? And under the nose, of the two sons of Herods and one of the busiest places on earth, the Via Maris. Yes. Let's go to the next one. By the way, if it's too much, you can just tell the pastor to kick me out. No, no. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, this is probably, uh, okay, we could have chose, we, we could choose any other site in Israel to do this demonstration. 
we chose this one because that's the latest discovery and the response that I'm getting from many of my guests that are coming here, and by the way, we don't call you tourists, okay? Let me open brackets for a moment. You are our guests. When you would come to Israel, we'll say shalom and welcome home. You know what? I hate tourists. <laughs> when you come, you are not a tourist. You are a friend. We don't, I don't need tourists. We don't need tourists. Our, our economy is based on high-tech industry. When you come, you are our friends. And we will only give you the hospitality of your friends. Okay? And that's the purpose. So, our friends, when they come over here after visiting this place, they will say that the whole tour was worth it. This is the latest discovery, and many people believe that that's the fulfillment of the prophecy, the stones will cry out. Yes. 2009, or before 2009, if you see this picture, you will see bungalows and people bathing, yes, at the Sea of Galilee. And the area was purchased by a Christian association in a purpose to build a pilgrimage hotel. And again, a coincidence. Uh, okay, actually, uh, uh, the person who uh, uh, started it was uh, Father Solana from Mexico. And the legend says that the night before, he prayed God, please God, don't let us find any archaeology. <laughs> because if you find archaeology in Israel, you have to excavate it on your own account. But the first hit of the bobcat in the ground hit a stone that was found in the center of Jesus' time synagogue, okay? The very same structure that Yeshua and his disciples sat in it, yes? And spent so much time in it. And this stone is incredible, unprecedented. It's actually a 3D model, yes? Symbolic, artistic model of the temple in Jerusalem, okay? And you will see it right away. Anyway, that's changed the whole plan, yes? And the city was excavated only 2009, waiting 2,000 years just for you. <coughs> Let's get to the next one. Okay, this is it. Uh, doesn't look like this today, but that's exactly how they found it. And that's the stone. And you can see the stone uh, facing to the south. That's the direction of Jerusalem, okay? And that synagogue is enough for 100, at least for 130 people to sit in this room. This is only the middle room, but there was also another room. So I want to see, uh, speak for a few minutes about the synagogue. What do you say? Yes, okay? Because I think there is a connection between this synagogue and where we are today. Yes? I think you can already see the, the connection. You're going to see the stone. Where the synagogue came from? Okay, in the book of Kings, we read about prophet Elisha and the Shunammite woman. Are you familiar with this story? Yes. Okay, uh, he lived on Mount Carmel and he did this journey many times and he stayed in the house of the Shunammite woman, a very wealthy uh, lady that built a room, an upper room, a bed and a lamp and uh, he uh, prophesied for her son and she had the son. But in the springtime in Israel, uh, you can have heat waves and you must harvest your field. And one of those days, the son, yes, their, her only son, said, oh, my head, my head. And uh, the father uh, told uh, the servants, take him to his mom. And he was on his mom, but he died this afternoon. So the woman said, the Shunammite, sent to her husband to take, take a donkey and a servant and to go to the house of Elisha, the house of the man of God. And her uh, husband asked her, yes, or asked his servant to ask her, why are you going? Why will you go to him today? Is it neither new moon nor Shabbat? And she said, all is well. Of course, nothing is well. Nothing was well. But from here, you can understand that the house of the prophet the house of Elisha on Mount Carmel was used for congregation, for people to come around to the house of the Lord on the day of Shabbat, yes, and the first days of the Jewish month. So I believe 
that the synagogues or the house of the prophet is actually the prototype of the synagogues who came later and probably the prototype of this place where we are right now. So we are in the house of the man of God, the house of the prophet. Yes, I hope it makes sense. Which activities in the synagogue in Jesus' time? Today the Jews are praying, I'll explain about it in a minute. Today the Jews are praying in the synagogue three times a day, but that started way later. Only after the Romans destroyed the temple and we couldn't keep the blood sacrifices, the Jews started to pray three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening time. But in Yeshua days, yes, when we read the gospel, People didn't pray in the synagogue, okay? So which activities in the synagogue on that time? And look what we found. The stones will cry out. That was found actually at the city of David about 105 years ago, and it's called Theodosius' inscription. It's written in Greek, and it's a sign that came from the entrance of a synagogue from Jesus' time. Synagogue in Jerusalem. So first of all, we can learn that there was a synagogue in Jerusalem when the temple was still exist. So the synagogues did not replace the temple. It was a complementary activity to the temple. And we can read over here about which activities in the temple in Jesus' time. Theodosius, the son of Etanus, priest and the head of a synagogue, son of a head of a synagogue, and grandson of a head of a synagogue. Build this synagogue for the reading of the Torah and the teaching of the commandments and uh, uh, for uh, guest house and rooms and water installations, ritual bath, <coughs> for the needy strangers and uh, uh, its foundation stone was laid by his ancestors, the fathers and the Simonides. So this is called Theodosius inscription. Tells us what they did in a synagogue. Taught the Torah, and the commandments, yes, a gathering place, and giving charity on hospitality, yes, to the pilgrims on the way. So this is, if you wish, the prototype of where we are today. When you go there, you will see the room. Uh, you can actually, uh, okay, you cannot sit on those benches anymore, although one, we got a group and we sat down just to take, check how many people we can sit together. Uh, but you can actually see the benches. You need to imagine the cushions, okay? But you can see the same seat where Yeshua was sitting and the disciples were sitting. And you can see the middle room where they read out loud the Torah in the day of Shabbat. Remember, Jesus was reading the book of Isaiah. So on this stone, we believe there was a furniture, another furniture on top of it. And this stone was found in the midst of the synagogue. And on this stone, they placed the Torah scroll and read it out loud to the people in the synagogue. Yes? Maybe you read Isaiah 61 yeah. on this stone. Now, this is, not, this is only a replica. Yes, the original one is in a, uh, uh, it's in, uh, uh, still uh, not presented to the public. Again, only 2009. You cannot read much about it because nothing much published. But this is probably a 3D symbolic model of the temple in Jerusalem. You can see the menorah. On the top, yes, I'm not sure if you can see, it looks like a tree, but this is the rake that fixed the altar. And you need to think in 3D, because what looks over here like the menorah standing on a box, yes, it's actually the menorah behind the golden altar. And the two pillars at the entrance to the temple, Boaz and Yakin. So you need to think in 3D. And the face of it, very interesting, the showbread table. Because we found 12 pieces. And the number 12, like the 12 loaves of bread, the showbread table that you have right over here. So all those elements over there. What can we learn from that? Again, I'm going to make it very short. There is far more. You can see the wheels of fire on the other side from the book of Daniel, the chariots of fire. So 
we are still learning it, but this is about holistic, mystic connection between the Galilee and Jerusalem. The people that gather together in the synagogue, they are connected to the temple in Jerusalem. And the same over here. The temple maybe is gone, but it's still in us. So this is called Magdala Stone. Magdala, by the way, in Aramaic, the tower. It was a fortified city, destroyed by the Romans in the year of 68 AD, what we call the Great Revolt, and probably covered with mud ever ledge, and that's why it's been preserved uh, so miraculously. I want to move to another subject, okay? Just one more. Uh, this is the theater of Caesarea. Actually, we're going to start the tour over there. And the pastor had the chance to preach at the same theater where probably, most likely, Paul was preaching. How cool is that? That's also uh, the, th the same place where Agrippa II, the grandson of Herod the Great, uh, died eaten by worms. Yes? People called him God, and he was striked. So the Bible really come alive. So we are switching to a new subject, which is something that we usually talk about uh, during the tour. Uh, by the way, I'm going to speak about some things that, OK, I'm going to warn you before. Uh, I see some kids in the audience, and I'm not sure if I can s speak about everything, but we'll see. I want to speak about the Romans uh, for the next few minutes, OK? Can I s Yes. It's fine. I'm going to speak about rape. Yes. I'm going to speak about death. It's fine. All right. We're going to learn a lot about the Roman culture. The Roman culture, the greatest, imp the Roman Empire in its climax in Jesus' time ruled the world for the longest time, the largest empire ever. In the time of Yeshua, Augustus was the Caesar. He ruled Rome for 57 years, and he established what we call the Roman peace, Pax Romana. The peace was achieved by the blood of all the other nations. The Roman's mythology tells you that Romus and Remulus, you remember those two twin brothers? They were born when the god of war, Maris, raped their mother, and from this violence act, the two twin brothers were born. The mother died during birth, and they were nursed by a she-wolf. And if you go to Rome, you will see the wolf, yes? And the two twin brothers, Romus and Remulus. So the Romans saw themselves as pack of wolves. That's how they justify their cruelty. And they saw themselves as the children of Maris. And they believed that gods, the Roman gods, appointed them to rule the whole world. And we're going to learn a lot about the Roman uh, culture. And that will help us to understand a lot of things. Now, this is the theater. And what, you can learn, what we learned about the Roman city, you can actually apply to any other Roman city in the world. And that's what I want to talk about. Because all those Roman cities were built, built exactly in the same structure. Each city had the same facilities, such as theater for theater shows and for speaking to the audience, yes, also for political uh, gatherings. A theater for theater shows and political gatherings. An amphitheater as a mass execution place. OK, the cross if you want to do it uh, um, individual, but if you want to massacre uh, a lot of people, you need something big like Colosseum. The main street, the Cardo, the public latrines, the public bathhouse, the Agora, and all those facilities, each city had exactly the same structure. What's the idea over here? They want to rule the whole world. They want everybody to be the same. So those cities express the unity of the Roman Empire, express the spirit of the Romans, their brutality. 
and also created the unity of the Roman Empire. And when they came to a new territory, they took one of the local aristocracy. How are you doing, Herods? Good. And used the local aristocracy to rule the people. And that's why you hear about Herod the Great, the great builder. Why he builds? Integration. To bring those barbarian Jews into the arms of the Roman Empire. And that was the idea behind all those building projects. This is something new that we start added uh, to all our tours. It's a city called Bechian. It was the capital of the Decapolis. Caesarea Maritima was the capital city of the land. And this city, Beijing, was the capital of the Decapolis. The Decapolis, Deca, 10 polis, cities, was a confederation of 10 Greco-Roman culture cities. And that was the capital. It was destroyed on earthquake. And because of that, it was preserved incredible way. The stones will cry out. And the reason why we talk about this place, because I believe that those could be the gates of Hades that Jesus refers to. Remember from the Sea of Galilee, they went out or north to the area of Caesarea Philippi. And we learn from, Ju from Josephus, that around Caesarea Philippi was a very large amphitheater. Yes, after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in the year of 70, Titus, uh, he didn't come back to Rome right away. He wanted to celebrate his victory by making those horrible games in this amphitheater. Not this one, but the one at Caesarea Philippi. That's where he made the Jewish war prisoners kill their own brothers for the enjoyment of his soldiers. And the holes that you see over there might be the gates of Hades. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let me try and explain. Um, okay. You know that you see those places in American movies, yes? I think all the boys over here saw the gladiator, no? So many times we think that the American Hollywood movies kind of exaggerating. In this case, according to my teachers, yes, uh, Jonathan Price from the Princeton University, the movies don't, exa don't exaggerate enough. Okay? The movies are not as horrible as what the games were. There was a lot of blood. A lot, a lot of blood. Actually, the English word arena came from Latin. Arena means sand. They used to spread, uh, throw the sand on the floor to absorb the blood after each killing. Every day, okay, those amphitheaters, yes, a theater will be a half a circle. An ampi will be two theaters together, a round with arena at the center. A theater for theater show, an amphitheater for executing people. And there were amphitheaters like this in every medium-sized city, hundreds of them all around the Roman Empire, and they were active for hundreds of years. And that was the threshold to the, to the underworld for many, many people. And uh, Brother Boyd over here uh, know that my heart is with the animals as well. Uh, actually, all the, grid, all the predators of uh, Africa, Asia, and uh, Europe, many of them were extinct or almost extinct because of those horrible games. They slaughtered the animals as well. Every day, and many days like this during the year, started with a parade. The mob filled the place. Uh, the games were sponsored either by the Caesar himself at Rome or by the local governor. And 
Every day they start with parade, with music, and they brought in the box. The box over there called the bed of Leventinesis. Leventinesis is the goddess of the underworld. Now, the reason they didn't call it Hades, because they used Latin. The Roman gods and the Greek gods are exactly the same gods, just different names. Okay? Instead of uh, um, uh, Zeus, they called him Jupiter. But it's the same gods, there's different names. So that's called the bed of Leventinesis. And in this bed, they put the dead people after they were killed. Gladiators, professional swordsmen, but war prisoners were executed. How you do it? You give one of them sword, the other one have no sword. And they were very creative about it. People used to know each other. People used to love each other. We had to force, were forced to fight and to kill their own brothers, their own family members, to the amusement of the mob. And if you refuse to do that, you're going to be killed in the most horrible ways. And you must fight until the end, until one of you is dead. But even if you won, yes, one of you have sword and the other one no. Even if you won, there is no chance because they bring another one, another one, another one, another one, another one, until all war prisoners were executed as human sacrifices to please the Roman gods. At the end of the battle, uh, it was not just the battle, it was also a show, if you wish, uh, a game, a show. There was a servant dressed like the god Mercurius. Mercurius is the god of the merchants, and he had to check if the deal is finished or not. So he have his staff, and by the way, we're about to finish in a few minutes. Uh, he have his staff, iron staff, which is uh, hot, uh, until it's uh, red hot. And he goes into the arena and he stabs the body to make sure that the person is not making himself dead. Okay? And then another guy dressed as uh, Pluto or Hades, Pluto in Latin, Hades in Greek, with uh, some kind of uh, horrible uh, tool dragging the body on the sand uh, all the way to right here. So those holes were called pota leventinesis, or if you, if you wish, in Latin, uh, in Greek, the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades. So when you be there, um, it's very difficult, I know, uh, but again, you haven't seen nothing yet. Uh, we don't like to, to sit with a crowd, yes? We like to stand at the arena because we want to feel how the people felt when they were there. You can close your eyes and hear the shouts and the moking of the crowd. And that's the same place where the early Christians, many of them, entered their life. It was not just the threshold to the, after, uh, to the afterlife for the Jews, but also for the Christians. And the Christians actually refused to play the game. Uh, the Romans were mocking them for that, like not brave enough. They called them gladiators of noon, executed them on a lunch break. And they refused to uh, uh, play the game and to uh, let the Roman mob to enjoy. So. What they did in those horrible places, they glorified God. I would like to end with this, and I think that we should end with uh, the next uh, when I'm thinking about all those uh, uh, horrible places, this is what come to my mind. Can you all read it? I'm sure the pastor will have something to say about this. And we know, this is Paul, that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them 
who are the called according to his purpose. So those places, the routes that were built for the Roman army to suppress the people all over the world, were now used by the disciples to carry the news, the good news. The boats with the slaves rowing under it were used to take Paul from Caesarea to Rome until the end of the world. And the prophecy of Jesus, yes, the Holy Spirit will guide you from here until the end of the earth, as far as Kentucky. <laughs> Been fulfilled. Now, back then, they didn't have the TV and the speakers. So the same place they used for those vulgar displays in the theater were now used by Paul and the disciples to preach. So the multitude of people can hear them. And the same places that were used for those horrible executions used to glorify God's name. Thank you very much.